Are we ready? Yes. And we're live. Woohoo! Yay. As I said last time, the, the process was faster. It mm-hmm. was not this time. Nope. Because not a fan of the lighting in the last episode. We're, ge- we're working it out. Whew. We're trying new things. It's a process. Yes. We're getting there. Slowly but surely. We got new mics. Yes. I'm all, I'm literally yes. looking at like that camera going, okay, that's not in the way. Looking at yours. <laughs> like, okay, that's not in the way. I'm just so paranoid that something's going to suddenly just go wrong. Go wrong. Yeah. Because it always does. Pretty much. Yeah. Constantly. Story of my life. <sighs> okay. Um, Our new microphones are great. Hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, we're really, we'll at this point, I'm not sure, but I guess we're going to find out. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, guys, sorry. This is like a rough start today. Yeah. It's straight up like too much stuff to do before. She was hungry. Yeah. Not bubbly yet. Nope. I'm get, um, we'll get there. We're working on it. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of just going to go. Wow. This, so I'm, also something that I was thinking about, we've realized what our faults are. Oh yeah. We, we can talk about what our uh, self realizations yeah. and habits and stuff. So, um, apparently, which I've known my entire life <laughs> is it takes me a very long time to tell any story whatsoever. Cause every detail is important and you need to know every little thing in order to really fully grasp and understand a story. And um, I've always told stories that way my whole life. And apparently that's not correct. <laughs> it really was one of those things that in editing, I was like, oh, this is like 20 minutes. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And I was like, ooh. And then I, w- and then I had flashbacks to, I can't wait to get to get to the climax of this story. Uh, and I was like, ooh. No, but really. Ooh. So we're instituting a new uh, shot clock as it were yeah we're actually getting a physical clock Mm -hmm. to have on set but a shot clock for story times so if we have a story that we need to tell two minutes that's it two was it two minutes i thought it was gonna be five minutes oh that's too much time all right well i mean i mean your story was 20 minutes are you sure see i skip details so people don't even know what i'm talking about oh so it's two minutes two we need give us your input (laughs) y'all how much time is do we need to tell a story I don't know, but I mean, story times can't be every episode either. So, I, I mean, I don't know. I we'll, guess we we'll can start to gauge thought. it. We could start yeah. to gauge it as we're listening, mm-hmm. whether or not this is like interesting. Yeah. As Because if the story, as long as the story itself is interesting, we should yeah. be good. But if it's like. Maybe we have a, a level, like levels, like a level of difficulty, like a, okay, this is definitely like a two minute story. It doesn't need to take that long or this is more involved. It needs to be a five minute story yeah maybe i don't know i don't know see you're like you're i I was prepared for five and you're like like, two and i'm like are you sure see um uh i deal in extremes (laughs) apparently (laughs) i'm like either 20 minutes or two there's no in between so uh but yeah we're gonna work on some things so we can make the show better for everyone else we'll try because we're just like oh i guess you guys don't know us that well yet so you might not yeah understand or care one day you will Mm-hmm. one day one day you'll want us to take 20 minutes to tell a story mm-hmm. and care about all the little details but as of right now nah no um i have faults as well <gasps> you're perfect what are you talking about i know i mean i guess i just have, i'm just, i guess i'm just making them up so <laughs> my faults are one i speak way too fast mm-hmm. like to the point that sometimes when i hear myself i'm like what did she say did full words actually come out of her mouth or no? Yeah. Um, that has been a struggle my entire life. Um, and then I also don't always navigate a story that well where mm. I'm like. Mm. But see, that's I'm, where I, that's where I come in. Yeah. Like you said, I, I tell too many details and sometimes you don't give enough or enough context. But see, it's way easier to jump in and ask a question if yes. I'm missing a detail than it is for me to go. That wasn't important like cut that out yeah say that again but better (laughs) yeah so like pretty much like i'm like oh okay yeah you can help me navigate but i can't help you stop so what you're saying is that we both have faults but mine are worse yeah and yours are way better yeah i I guess (laughs) (laughs) we both have faults but like mine are like not as bad yeah yeah oh okay yeah. All right. So, cool. you know, now that we've established our faults, I'm going to be taking this off with some uh, stories, I guess. Or like one's a story, I guess, and one's like a a thought process situation. Okay. So, oh, what's easier? Mm, all right. Hand me. Hand, hand it to me. Oh, I got to open it. Uh, yeah. You got to open it. And put, 
put my finger on it. Yeah. So we need to, we established at this point in our friendship, relationship, whatever, working relationship, friendship, basically that we need, we have approached the level of trust between each other that we need to add each other's fingerprints to our MacBooks. Yeah. Because we already know each other's passwords on our phones. So I I think, yeah, we've determined that we're we're ready to take the next step. Yeah, we're ready ready to move forward with our friendship. (laughs) I mean, I've hand fed you chicken nuggets in a car. On the way to CT Swizzle. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like we have a pretty intimate friendship at this point. (laughs) Started off strong. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I definitely, I have like anxiety whenever I'm driving and I have to eat and it freaks me out. I'm just not Mm -hmm. good at it. I mean, if it's a sandwich, I can deal with it. But if I have to like... I can't do the dipping in the sauces and all. I can't do all that. I have literally eaten chicken and dumplings while I was driving by myself in the car. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Think about think about it, how that might have okay. gone. And I didn't spill. Did not make a mess. Wow. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. So basically, I'm just like skilled. <laughs> yeah. So like you, I have faults that aren't as bad as yours, but like you, your skills are better. I have a better skill, life skill set. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to eating food in cars, I guess. We're good to go. Yeah. We even each other out. Um, That's why we work so well together. We're just gonna, great. The yin to the yang. Yin, is it yang or yin? Yin. Yin yang or yin yang? Yin, yin yang twins? I never thought about it. Is it yin, yin yang? I, I feel like I've always heard people say, you're the yin to my yang. But is it, you're, you're the yin to my... Someone let us know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I could definitely just look it up, but I'm not going to. Yeah. That's not fun. We're just going to continue to say it potentially wrong or right. Yeah. But and it's going to be different every time. Yeah. Keeps you on your toes. Exactly. It's super like, you never I'm know. spontaneous. Exactly. <laughs> I'm having issues with words today. Like the, the processing system. It's like the CPU on a computer where like everything is almost at a hundred. So it has issues getting the rest out. <laughs> Are you going to start just like sounding, making noises <laughs> that sound like you're a plane about to take off? Yeah, probably. Just like fans going. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sound like my computer when it's using premiere pro that shit sounds like it's about to take off something like it's gonna blow up yeah. <laughs> that would be really bad my mom's uh she has an air fryer that makes the same noise when it's starting to heat up and it's it startles me every time she turns <laughs> it's it on startle- it startles me i'm like uh, what the f- what's that's, that that's just a word i feel like i don't hear used a lot startles, startles. i was startled yeah. you know who else was startled who danny hamlin <laughs> <laughs> Segway. Hey. okay so i don't know if you've heard i think you have heard about mm. it but for those of you who don't know so on october 30th martinsville speedway hosted the final playoff elimination race for the nascar cup series which is the phoenix cup and that is actually taking place today which is november 6th mm. the day after my birthday happy birthday okay. i'm 23 okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory and then we'll get into like the juicy bit. Okay. The juicy bits. Mm-hmm. See, I feel like that's I, like a you language. I love bits. the juicy bit. <laughs> so eight drivers entered the event with four set to be eliminated ahead of next week's championship race at Phoenix Raceway. So that mm-hmm. we've established today. So to make it to the championship, you're basically going through rounds of playoffs mm-hmm. in these races. So eight drivers entered and four had to... You- eight drivers enter. Four leave victorious to head to the championship. Four go home in shame. Yes. So you had to finish in the top four. So, um, in a world. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's a trailer you, voice. You literally just made me think of something else, but I'm going to stick to this. But just, <laughs> I need to put a pin on that. Put a pin in in a world. In, in, put a pin in the um, movie, trailer, movie voice? trailer voice. Okay. So, on the final lap of the 2022 Xfinity 500... The oh shit! It's a word I don't know how to say. What is pen penultimate? Pen, pen, penultimate. That's actually how it said. I just thought it was going to be something. Mm-hmm. I thought it looked like penultimate, but it was going to be like really yeah. hard to say. Penultimate is not the last. It's like the second to last. Yeah. Okay. So though, on the final lap of the 2022 Xfinity 500, the penultimate race in the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs, Ross Chastain. He basically needed to overtake Danny Hamlin to advance to the final round because he he was one of said drivers. 
that was up for, he would have had to finish in the top four so he was one of the ones that i guess was so, up for the championship so is it like a points system yeah oh, yeah. oh i don't know oh, I, don't know. I okay. don't know that part so basically he just needed to finish the top four in order to make yes. it yes he to the, and to the championship danny okay. hamlin was the same way so mm-hmm. both of them were up for this mm-hmm. so wait so who are the two people it's ross chat you have ross, ross chastain just ross and danny got it too chess. many names i get confused ross and danny that's true flashbacks to chess <laughs> They're new. They're stupid. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So Ross and Danny. So it's I don't know if you grew up playing any NASCAR video games ever. The only racing video games I've ever remember playing mm-hmm. were Mario Kart, which counts. It, it counts. It counts. I I was pretty good at Mario Kart. If I could toot my own horn. Toot toot. Thank you. It's a me. It's a me, Mario. <laughs> Who were you always in Mario Kart? Uh, Yoshi. Okay. I was always Link. Okay. Wait. Link from Zelda. Or no. if I... It, well, okay. In the newer one. Mario. In the new... He is oh, in the newer okay. ones. But in the older ones, I was... I was very confused because I'm always, like, that's not... I think I was Toad most of the time. Okay. Yeah. I was Yoshi and um, occasionally I would pick the babies. Yeah. Those were cute. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, oh, but so I was Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. And then if I ever went to like an arcade... There might be like a random racing game mm-hmm. that I sucked at. Yeah. Like I with actual wheel and yeah. stuff was not Always good. horrible at those. Always just randomly hitting the NOS button on it. And it was, yeah. Yeah. Pretty horrible. Yeah. I was, I was always bad at those. Mm-hmm. I grew up playing NASCAR games. My dad was super, super, super in the NASCAR. And I also grew up playing Need for Speed games. Mm-hmm. But in NASCAR, you could do this thing in the game called like wall riding, which is basically where you would slam your car against the very edge of the actual track. So the wall of the track mm-hmm. and just slam the gas. And because it, and it would just propel you mm-hmm. and it made you ridiculously fast, which and you would I'm pass like, everybody f- in my head, trying to figure out the physics of how that actually works. Mm-hmm. I'm probably putting too much thought into it, but I'm like, how does I know that it can help like steer the car? It's because you're not having to slow down at all. So when you're not doing that and mm-hmm. you're like, okay, let me take the racing line. You slow down. You, I, when you get to so a corner. So you don't hit the wall. Ah, so you're slowing down to sense. do the racing line. Cause you're basically doing the most minimum. Like, what am I trying to say? The racing line is like, okay, well, uh, you're not wasting time basically. So mm-hmm. it's, you're just like, you're taking the quickest line possible. Yeah. It's, from the, point most a to point defi- B. Yeah, it's the most efficient but yeah. you have to slow down. But you have to slow... Uh, and with the wall, you're just fucking full throttle. You don't have to slow down nope. at all because the point of the racing line is so you don't hit the wall and damage your car and slow yeah. down. But you're having to physically like not go the physical fastest your car can go mm-hmm. so you can avoid doing that. Yes. So when you ride the wall, it's literally pedal to the metal, like balls to the wall. 150 miles an hour. There ain't nothing stopping you. And then the wall just steers you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Jesus Christ. So we did that in games all the time, right? Yeah. And I did that all the time. I did grow up playing a lot of the NASCAR games. None recently, but like I did have some for the PlayStation 2, Nintendo 64. So this leads us to what happened in Martinsville Speedway mm-hmm. on October 30th. As we said, we have Ross and Danny who both need to finish in the top four in order to progress to the championship. And so on the final lap, the very final lap of this race, Chastain knows that he has to overtake Danny. That's the only way he's going to make it to the final round. He was five places behind Danny. So Ross is so like... So he's in like 10th, right? Yes. Or- because Danny Danny was fourth. So okay. he was ninth. So he's ninth. Okay. Yeah. So he's five places behind. It is the final turn, the final lap of this race. And he's just like, you know, I'm going to try it. I have nothing to lose. Literally, if I don't do anything yeah. else, there's I nothing, mean, nothing else to do. It's the last lap. Any damage to his car. I mean, the, the race is over. <laughs> so he wall rides and jumps five places fucking places forward and takes the fourth place spot from danny over the right right as they're hitting the fucking finish line take he, he takes it. it and he makes it into the top four if that ain't a ha- uh, was a hail mary i mean it was just the most insane thing yeah. i've ever seen because i'm like i've never seen uh, in video games mm-hmm. you did that you did that in video games yeah it was just the craziest shit i've ever seen i'm like that is literally legendary like no one 
no one does this. No one has ever done this. Not successfully. No one's ever done it successfully. And it actually worked and accomplished what it was supposed to. And so he did it. And my favorite part, (laughs) because I was aware of this happening. And so, because I follow Formula One. Mm -hmm. um, And so some of the drivers in Formula One were retweeting the video of it happening Uh and talking about, holy shit like this is some like video game shit like this is like this is what racing is about like it's exciting and it's literally putting everything on the line yeah just to win like literally the like that race that he's in oh this is kind of close to my face okay that race that he's in like that he made the championship that's today and mm-hmm. i've never i couldn't tell you the last time i was like let me watch a nascar race i literally want to watch it because i want to know if he's going to win now because mm-hmm. how fucking legendary is that that's, that's crazy. like the equivalent uh, you've seen cars mm-hmm. and when he um when lightning copies um doc's move where he basically wall rides uh-huh. and then he jumps over and all that's like what that is in real mm-hmm. life it's fucking insane it's literally just like you can't believe so then he's asked about it so mm-hmm. ross is asked about it afterwards there's so many reaction videos they're so funny my my favorite is um somebody made a a, a video of the different onboards so like the for people who don't know <laughs> The onboard is basically the every car in uh, I assume in NASCAR, it's in Formula One mm-hmm. this way. They have a camera on the actual car itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can see uh, I think it sits kind of like um, it's behind and a little bit above the driver. So you can see their hands on the wheel and you can kind of see what's going on um, a little bit in front of them. And so the onboard is the camera, but then mm-hmm. you can also hear the team radio. Yep. So like you can hear the driver. So for, in this one, you could hear the drivers, you could hear their spotters, you could hear like their their basically so strategists and stuff, yeah. their team principals or whatever. You can hear them all mm-hmm. on the radio being like, holy shit, well, yeah. what is he actually doing this? Like all of their different yeah. reactions to it. They're like, that's crazy it's so good it's just the it's the funny have you seen his onboard camera like ross's uh Holy maybe i don't recall fuck it's just like i've seen like the different perspectives mm-hmm. of it i don't remember if i've seen his oh my god it's so it's just insane because you're like it looks like he's just it looks the footage looks sped up mm-hmm. that's how fast he's going so what i i saw i think briefly a little bit of one of the interviews he did and mm-hmm. he was basically like I've always kind of wanted to do it and th- yeah. we've all done it in video games. So I figured I could try it, but I don't know if you've seen it. Did he say if that was something that they had practiced or, th- or even discussed as a strategy or if he just in the moment was like, I'm gonna go for it. I, I haven't seen any interviews that I think he always wondered. I've not, mm-hmm. I didn't see any interviews that was, I, I I don't think as your team, they would ever want you to do that. Cause that car has now damaged you yeah. and you have to, you have to put money into mm-hmm. that. I, yeah. So I'm pretty, so I did take an excerpt of one of his interviews. Um, he said, and this, the reason it's like, to me, it's, it's just, his, the whole thing is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So Travis showed me this, right? And I'm like, we did that in video games. So finally mm-hmm. we get to his interview and he talks about how he learned the tactic playing the video game NASCAR 2005 on his Nintendo GameCube growing up. I love GameCube. Ex- yeah, for GameCube stands. And he's like, I haven't even thought about doing a move like that since back when I played the game. It's wild. So yeah, he literally like just in the moment was like, got nothing to lose. That's like, that's some serious like back pocket strategy shit of like racing hasn't been, ex- <sighs> I'm sorry to me. Like I grew up with granted, I was like five or six when Dale Earnhardt died, but like you would have thought that he was like my uncle because of how much my dad loved that man. And pretty much if your dad was in the NASCAR, he probably loved Dale Earnhardt. And it was just, he was just a badass. So it's like, for me, I feel like nothing that exciting. Like one of the other things, like example being with Dale Earnhardt, he did like a, a grass pass once and where he like his car got, and normally when a car gets in the grass, it gets mm-hmm. loose and they fuck up. Dale Earnhardt did not. And he like got in the grass and he shot right back forward to first place. And so it mm-hmm. was like, at that time you're like, holy fucking shit, this man is like the shit. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I don't know of anything that exciting happening since then. So it's like, especially in NASCAR, I feel like, you're like, when's the last time you want to talk about NASCAR? Not being a hater, it's just something that to me it lost so much of its excitement yeah. right around after, like, right, pretty much right when Dale Earnhardt died. I mean, I don't really know enough about. There's so many motorsports, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't really know enough about NASCAR other than the few bits I've seen where I'm like, okay, they just make a bunch of left turns. I mean, I you do know, like I like I, I know yeah. that there's strategy involved yeah. and all that and i again i just don't know it yeah um yeah i don't either and i think that it just 
to the I think the average uh uh watcher, the average person just if I'm scrolling through different clips, like two, you know, if I'm scrolling through like five or 10 seconds mm-hmm. of a race mm-hmm. from each of these different motorsports, I'm like, NASCAR is probably the least interesting in terms of like the track. Cause yeah. at least with Formula One and um, like IndyCar, I think you have different types of tracks mm-hmm. and yeah. stuff, right? So there's different, you know, there's curves and straights and chicanes and, you know, all this stuff. And yeah. I don't know, there's different types of terrain too oh, that you can race yeah. on. There's street races, you know, there's. Yeah like track races. So it's just a little more, I guess, diversity in terms of the like actual tracks. Yeah. So it provides for more excitement. Not every race is like the same, you know? Oh yeah. I think, I think a lot of the drivers have to do with how exciting Mm -hmm. it is. And so for me, like, again, grew up with Dale Earnhardt and the rivalry that ended up developing between him and Jeff Gordon. We were not Jeff Gordon stands in my house. Ironically though, I did take a picture with Jeff Gordon's car when I was like five years old and my dad was devastated. Oh, he was like, (laughs) No. How could how could you betray me? Pretty much. It was my mom's fault. <laughs> but I do have that picture somewhere. Um and and also Dale Earnhardt uh Jr. So mm-hmm. he was like I mean growing up he was like the 8 the red Budweiser number 8 car. He would go on to be like the 88 car and mm-hmm. I think I can't remember who his sponsor was. I want What Amp? is about what is it about race cars that when you picture a race car in your head it's always red? Lightning McQueen. No, well, for even me, before I mean, that. yeah, I was going to say for me, well, see, no, like for me, when I think of a race car, I do, I, th- I think of Dale Earnhardt, bl- jet black car, mm-hmm. or I think of his son, mm-hmm. Dale Jr. with his red car. And even though, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's Which, not a fair assessment because really Tony Stewart, he used to have a um, orange Home Depot car and I was, I liked Tony mm-hmm. Stewart growing up and Jeff Gordon's car was like that rainbow situation. Mm-hmm. And he... I don't necessarily, to me, I feel like when I think of cars, it's just that they look so different now. Mm -hmm. Like the cars of tomorrow is what I think they have started to market in some time in the 2000s. And it just wasn't as interesting looking. I I don't know. And maybe that's just the nostalgia speaking, but eh. But I mean, all that being said, this has like made me want to watch NASCAR today to see if Mm -hmm. this fucking dude wins. Because that's some boss ass shit. Like it is literally fucking crazy to think that he was like, I'm ninth fucking place and I have to finish in the top four to move fucking forward. Fuck it. I'm going mm-hmm. forward. He could have died. Yeah. Like it was very dangerous and it worked out. And I'm like, yeah, I think holy that's, fuck. that's part of it too, is the, when you are following, I think any sort of sport, you kind of want, you know, if, if you're going to be a fan <clears throat> of somebody like a diehard, yeah. like this is my person, I'm buying their merch, their hat, their jersey, well, that, that's whatever. That's what I was thinking. I was like, you kind of want somebody who is so passionate mm-hmm. and so willing to do whatever it takes to win yeah. that they go above and beyond and like do the crazy shit. Like you kind of, obviously you don't want anybody to get hurt or die or anything, but I mean, if they're willing to take the risk and it pays off and it works out and it's not like, well, damn, every time he takes a risk, he ends up crashing and people get hurt. Like that's lame. But if they take the risk and they're good enough, it's like mm-hmm. to you have to be good exactly. enough for the risky shit to pay Do off. You know, and it's like, that's the person I want to be a fan exactly. of. Do you know what Dale Earnhardt's nickname was? What? The Intimidator. Huh. He was such a fuck. I mean, just he was so badass. fucking cool, dude. Like, ugh. But so, yeah, I kind of just thought it was interesting because NASCAR hasn't been on my radar whatsoever, despite my family racing a lot. But they mm-hmm. we do like circle tracks, every dirt track, circle track stuff down mm-hmm. in the south. But I was like, wow, that made me like excited. I kind of want to mm-hmm. watch that today and see if he wins, because <laughs> I mean, that would make it even more legendary if he mm-hmm. wins. Like, that's insane. But yeah. Um. So the other thing we wanted to talk about today. Yes. Was uh, you wanted me to watch selena gomez's documentary that came out because you are a huge selena stan i am her documentary my mind and me was is on apple tv tv yeah um and fortunately i had a free three-month trial for apple tv that i activated this morning so we're all good there we're all good uh but so i watched it this morning before Mm -hmm. we came to record today that shit was depressing as fuck it was really I'm sad. upset that you made me watch that. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, sorry. It was it was a good documentary. Yeah. Uh, and we talked a little bit about it earlier today, mm-hmm. um, but we wanted to save most of it for the podcast. Yeah. But basically, the when I think of like a musician making a documentary, especially when they're about to go on tour, because this she started filming this before she went on the um, her revival revival tour. tour. If, That's the name of the album, by the way, that I was 
yeah. talking about yesterday where she made a Spanish version of. I was like, starts with an R. It's like revolution or something like that. But no, it's revival. She made a Spanish language version of revival. Anywho. But so she was going on her revival tour and that's what, and you explained to me that that's kind of what it was intended to be. Well, it was. Or started off anyway It like started that. off so much because the guy that filmed this filmed Madonna's documentary. Mm-hmm. That was a huge fucking deal when it, when it had come out. And he didn't want to do like a, oh, let me follow you on tour. He wanted to do the transition from like Disney pop star to like full fledged artist. So he saw that vision for it. So mm-hmm. it was going to be following her on tour, but it was also going to be very, very intimate. And he had told her like. I have to have access to everything Mm -hmm. or he couldn't do it because that's the other thing is it's not like, Oh, let me just show the tour and show what you want. I need to show everything, show this entire transition, Mm -hmm. which when that documentary starts, you could see that's where he was starting to take that direction Mm -hmm. because of what she was talking about and how upset she was. Oh yeah. She, so it basically opens up with her, uh, doing like, um, practice for tour. Mm -hmm. So they're doing rehearsals. Yep. And, um, so she, you know, they get through like, I think it's like the final rehearsal for the tour. And, um, she is just having a, like a meltdown in her dressing room, like a breakdown of like, just very upset saying like, she was like, Oh, I'm just so unhappy with it. I don't like the way that I look. I don't like, um, like every time I mess something up, it just sticks in my head. And I'm like, it, it, you know, she's just going on about how she's just not doing the best that she can. And like, she's stepping on her clothes and like, it's this whole thing. And, um, I mean, at one point when she's, they're talk they're trying on clothes for the wardrobe for the tour. She says like, you know, I, I have, I look like I have the body of a 12 year old boy. I don't mm-hmm. have an ass. And she was like, I, I just, I want to look like a woman. Mm-hmm. And like you said, that, that speaks to that sort of direction. Yeah for the documentary yeah was initially initially intended but then she ended up canceling her tour she got through 50 something dates of it and mm-hmm. then they ended up canceling the remainder of it because she w- had a basically a, a she had a mental breakdown. mental breakdown i mean she went into psychosis and went so that's, to a mental hospital and that's not you know. covered as much in the documentary mm-hmm. i mean it is but not as they talk detail. about it but yeah not detailed yeah in the rolling stones article that kind of went with this being mm-hmm. released she talks about she like went into psychosis mm-hmm. and it was like a really really horrible situation and it was you know she slowly came out of it they gave her her diagnosis but she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and she didn't share that until she went on miley cyrus's um like streaming like live Mm -hmm. show she had during the pandemic so that was where she actually first came public with her diagnosis i thought it was um interesting there's a moment where she's she's gonna do a speech Mm -hmm. at the psychiatric hospital Mm -hmm. and um she's kind of practicing her speech i think in the car on the way there or like in the hotel room maybe and so she's going over some things and i think i don't know if it's a manager or publicist or friend someone says something about like do you want to say actually the words i was diagnosed with bipolar disorder because the and she's like well why wouldn't i kind of you know talk about it that's what it is and they're like well basically once you put that name on it that's all the headlines are going to be and you know and she's like, okay, well, what's the downside of that? What maybe some people, they have the stigma attached to bipolar disorder. They may not want to work with me. She's like, well, I don't think I want to work with those people anyway. You know, if they wouldn't want to work with me because of, you know, a, a mental condition mm-hmm. that I have. So, um, so then she, they go kind of through that and then they, sh- I don't know if they just cut it out or she actually changed her speech to where once she actually, yeah. and she was very nervous before she mm-hmm. got up there. So she gets in front of all these people at the mental hospital. It's like a banquet or a gala or something. And she uh, starts to talk. And then she says, she gets to the part of the speech where she would have said, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And she doesn't say the words. Mm-hmm. She says, you know, I was, I, I finally got a diagnosis and I got answers and knowing what it was gave me some power to be able to like move forward with yeah. it. Which, you know, I mean, still the sentiment of that, I think, is great. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I did notice that she ended up not saying the words, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. I had noticed that, too, because I do know the first time she ever said it, it was to Miley Cyrus on that show. And so when I was watching the documentary, I was like, I knew she wasn't going to say that. So it was kind of interesting to Mm -hmm. see why maybe she didn't. Mm -hmm. Because maybe she was pressured to not say that. Or maybe she decided she wasn't ready to share it. One or the other or both. I'm not sure. Because I think when she was practicing, she was trying to figure out, like, should I say it? Should I not Mm -hmm. say it? But something about it that, like, yeah, to me, I've been a huge Selena Gomez fan since, I mean, pretty much was, like, Disney days. So Mm -hmm. I've always looked up to her, always just loved her, and I've always followed her journey throughout everything. And so I was was very curious what was going to be covered within the documentary. And I will say before, I mean, we can delve into the documentary, but one thing that I'm very disappointed by 
is not the documentary. I'm disappointed with some of the headlines I've seen from the documentary because it is very powerful and it explores mental health in sometimes not a very flattering way. It also, you know, really explores celebrity. Yeah, what the that's effect, like. The effects of fame and celebrity and what how it does affect mental yeah. health. But what I'm di- what I've found to be somewhat disappointing is some of the headlines I've seen where like they've talked about she had done an interview when right before the documentary was coming out where basically she had taken pictures with Haley Bieber recently mm-hmm. and they brought that up and she's like, you know, it wasn't even a big deal. It wasn't even a thing. But that was grabbing. I've seen more articles about that statement within an, an interview she did that's two seconds long where she's brushing it off as the headline than I have really seen a lot of headlines of the documentary itself. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, or they'll talk about, oh, I don't know. It was to me, a lot of it was some of the headlines are good. But once again, it's like the point is being proven of Like she had said in the documentary, when am I going to be enough on my own? When am I going to be enough on my own? Because she had, she, it was actually, they had asked her about a song with Justin. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think the only time she said his name throughout the entire thing, but somehow it's still somehow about them. And it's not just her, Mm -hmm. like about the whole documentary is literally about her. And it's like more headlines are being grabbed about one sentence. She said at an interview that was 0.5 seconds long and not about this amazing, like, relatable, and in a way, just study on celebrity mm-hmm. and what it can do to people. Yeah, I mean, there's one point in the um, documentary where she is doing interviews for press for um, her album Rare. Yep. And she's uh, basically in London doing, like, back-to-back interviews. Mm-hmm. And you can tell she's just miserable. She hates it. She absolutely hates it. She is so unhappy she's like there in the interview doing what she has to do, but she is not happy about it. She's not having fun. And the questions, I mean, they're just so, at least the, what they piece together and show in the documentary, the questions she's being asked are just so inane. Like they just don't matter. Yep. And at one point she's, uh, doing an interview and the person asks her a question. They say, um, you know, what do you see yourself doing? Basically, um, once you're done like being a celebrity, like making music kind of like, what do you see at the end of your career? Or, and she says, you know, I really see myself getting into the philanthropy. Um, and then the person asking the question is like, okay, yeah, great. And just kind of, I guess, moves on Mm -hmm. and she gets pissed. She does. Selena is like pissed to the point of tears. Like she's really upset. And she even sells to the person like, oh yeah, I can really, yeah, I can really tell that you cared about my answer or you were listening to what I had to say. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, I think that that is exemplified by what you're talking about of like, she produced, you know, she puts out this documentary that really does matter and talks about serious things and things of substance. Mm -hmm. And then the headlines and what other people are talking about, they're not listening to her. No, they don't care what she has to say. They don't care what her answer is. And they're just, okay, great. She said something. She's like a talking figurehead. She's just a little puppet. Yeah. And if it's not about that one little thing, now it's about her best friend, Raquel, where every Raquel, 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 and everyone now is like, she's a horrible friend that like, if you go on TikTok, everyone is a Raquel hater for the most part, it seems to be that then that's what they're talking about. And I'm like, do you think for a fucking second that Selena Gomez, who you say you are this huge stan of, you think you know her better than her best friend of over 10 years. Mm-hmm. You think that at first and all not, not. I guess to add to that, you think that Selena wants to get online and see you tearing her best friend down? Mm -hmm. You think that's ever going to make her want to ever be intimate and show us any of her life ever again? Like, at what point do you think that that was the right thing to do to dissect that? Because we saw... Am I being... If I'm being 100% honest, there were times watching the documentary, I was like, damn, Raquel's like kind of comes across as a bitch but there there i was kind of confused because there's one point when she first is kind of on screen Mm -hmm. where basically they're i don't know if selena's getting ready for something or they're talking in like a a hotel room or something raquel kind of walks in the camera's on her 
and she like she looks nice she's like done up her hair done wear a nice outfit or whatever and then she kind of like starts to say something or basically brings up some other topic not relevant to whatever the people in the room were talking about and selena kind of gives her a little bit of like a side eye and like an eye roll of like what are you doing like Mm -hmm. what are you talking about like And you can make a lot of uh, inferences based on that look and kind of Selena's reaction to it. Because to me, it kind of came across as like, this is not about you. Like you just walk into the room like you're the main character. (laughs) And and that's kind of what I picked up on a little bit. But I'm looking at that and I'm like, I have no other context for what would have happened prior to that or why she would be annoyed by what happened. And to me, like I didn't understand Selena's reaction to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, because it just looked like somebody walked into a room and was just talking. Like I don't. I didn't really understand it, but I know that in that moment, it's very easy to like look at that and immediately be like Raquel's a bitch. Oh, and there were, there were a few other times that like people, okay. And I guess the, I I had, I was of the opinion at first. I was like, wow, she seems kind of like me and Travis both were like, she's kind of like, it's coming across as like an ass. But then I started to think of it more and I'm like, I'm looking at this through the lens of how much I personally love Selena how I would just, I would love to speak to her, be her friend, any of that. And, and so, if anyone is anything less than perfect, glowing, perfect, completely yeah. friendly, genial, yeah. like anything less than that, and you're a cunt. Basically, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And that's the truth of it. And so it's very much like, she's a person. She's not perfect. I might like to think she is, but she's not. Mm-hmm. And so she's been friends with Raquel for over 10 years or 10 years or whatever. And it's like, I've rolled my eyes at you and you've rolled your eyes at me and I've gotten on your nerves and vice versa. Yeah. That's friendship. Sometimes That's relationships in yeah. general, like you're not going to get along a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Things sometimes, happen. Sometimes you're in a bad fucking mood. Yeah. Sometimes you have to hear shit. You don't want to hear. You can't have yes men around you all the time. And to me, I think that's looking at it that way. I don't think Raquel was trying to be the main character as much as she was the person in the room making Selena uncomfortable sometimes because she cares about her. And it's like, I think this is an important conversation to have, or I think, you know, you need to look at it this way or that way. And she wasn't kissing her ass. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make her a bad friend. And if that's people's perception of friendship, then you don't have any real friends you can depend on because you can depend on people that are honest with you above anything else. Yeah. So there's, uh, during that, uh, segment of the documentary where selena is in london doing these interviews and seems just completely miserable comes across very well on screen like she's miserable. she's miserable and then raquel calls her out on it she's like what's going on and then selena gets defensive well it, it, it starts off because they're talking about going to someone's birthday party uh, and yeah. then selena's like i'm not going to that because i have to do this 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 this, and that and i need to do this and then raquel's like well that's great yeah Basically, it's calling her out like, oh, that's just great, Selena. Like, like it's you're not basically going- it's about you. you're not wanting to go to our friend's birthday because you're too wrapped up in yourself and what you have going on. And but you're miserable and you don't even like it anyway. Yeah, that was kind of like mm-hmm. looking at it, the conversation that way. I'm like, yeah, she- Selena's allowed to be tired. That's yeah. fine. And but she's allowed same- to not want to go to social yeah. functions if she doesn't feel like she's going to have the battery, the energy. Like, I just need some rest and time yeah. to adjust between Cause I think it was like, she was, they were going to leave London mm-hmm. and like literally the night they got back or like the next day they were going to have to go to this birthday party thing. Yeah, And, and then she, the day yeah. after that, she was filming a music video. Yeah. And but she's like, well, I need to prepare for that. I need to rest. And then Raquel's like, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's great. And then, you know, there's that spat mm-hmm. between them. And at first I was like, oh, Raquel is so rude. And I'm like, actually, like I could see where she's coming from because she's kind of, if that's their mutual friend, mm-hmm. then she's probably like, well, she expects you there you're her friend and now it's you're like not gonna hurt go. her, her feelings if yeah. you don't go and like you you should it's important you should make time for it yeah, and, someone you need some yeah. you need that person in your life that's like mm-hmm. i understand i understand you're tired tired and i understand what's going on but that isn't always an excuse or a reason to not be there for your other friends mm-hmm. and so i mean that's kind of where i started to be like you know i could have easily seen myself having that conversation with one of my friends, if mm-hmm. I was in that situation. So I don't think that that, no. I also think maybe she's just because she's, because Raquel isn't like the, Oh, I'm super bubbly and I'm super mm-hmm. sweet. And I'm this doesn't make her a bitch. No, it just makes her like a real person. She's just very like straightforward. Yeah. She's straightforward. And she's like, you know, and this kind of goes back to if a woman's not, Oh yes, yes. Well, who you be? She's a bitch. And I'm yeah. like, I don't think that's fair to mm-hmm. say. And I think that all this criticism on Raquel is not only unwarranted, it's also, you really think Selena wants people to be talking about her best friend like that? Like, yeah. I mean, even at one point, um, Selena says, 
do you think that I'm complaining about my job? She's like, and Raquel's like, yeah, kind of sounds like it. And she's like, I'm not, I love my job. I love what I get to do. And like, I'm basically fortunate, like to have this job and like, I'm not complaining about work because you know, some people could say, oh, it's so hard being a celebrity and you get to Dude. have make a bunch of money and fly across the world and have adoring fans. And like, no, it actually is hard. But yeah. there is the perception of like, if you are a celebrity and you complain about any aspect of it, you're ungrateful. Right. Yeah. And so Selena's like, I'm not ungrateful. And Raquel's like, kind of sounds like y'all are kind of sounds like you're complaining about your job. And then Selena's like, I don't know what else you want from me. Mm-hmm. Raquel's like, and and that was interesting to me, the way that Selena phrased that. I don't know what else you want from me. And mm-hmm. Raquel's is it, it's almost like I don't want anything from you. I want for you. I want for you to be happy. I want things to go well for you and for you to be in a good mood, but she's basically like you're not happy. I know mm-hmm. you. I know when you're happy, Selena, and when you're not happy, Selena, and you are not happy. Yeah. And she's like I don't know what else you want. What can be done to make you happy? Mm-hmm. And like it was a very like it was a very tense conversation. Yeah. It was very like awkward on screen. Like while mm-hmm. you're watching it, you're like uncomfortable because they're having a it's a real discussion. Mm-hmm. Like that's not scripted. That was a real conversation that was caught on camera. That's and but that's how conversations are. They're they can not be all... awkward and tense, but they're being to the best that they can be honest with yeah. each other. And that's a real conversation you have with someone you care about. Exactly. And you know, it, I also find it like ridiculous that people would want to criticize the friend a friendship they're not a part of mm. they have no idea what it's like to actually be friends with selena gomez to be friends with raquel you do not know these people you know bits and pieces of these people and this is actually probably the most intimate way we've gotten to know her and her some of her inner circle even better but you know for raquel to be such like a bad friend i don't know why i didn't mean to do this with raquel's name that is her name but like for her to be such a bad friend, raquel yeah raquel that's her name <laughs> no but like raquel's such a bad friend well, I mean, she sure stuck by Selena's side when she was in psychosis. She sure, sure stuck by her side, like, through everything when she could have, I'm assuming her life might have been easier if she didn't. But that's what friendship is. And that's what, what relationships are, is sticking For better or worse. Yeah. For richer or poorer. Yeah. You're in basically married. <laughs> and in health. <laughs> till death do us part. <laughs> yeah. And so that was another thing that I was like, you know, here's just another example of people not... Um, another example of people not really talking about the important parts of the documentary, which I'm not trying to ta- also talk about the non important parts, but it's just showing how it's like, you have this amazing, beautiful documentary and you're focusing on this bullshit that isn't even the narrative of the documentary. You're making your own narrative for said documentary. And that's what you want to talk about. And, and you're talking about the most like, it's the tea, it's the drama superficial aspect of it exactly. when again it's not it, you know the headline is like Raquel's a bitch or is not a good friend to Selena and it's like her friends are toxic yeah and it's like no the actual conversation and headline should be like good on Selena for having good friends around her who will call her out on things but and and keep and keep it honest with her yeah. you know and be like and have and be willing to have the difficult conversations yeah like that's a good friend Yeah. And so I'm just like, you know, people, people that are saying, oh, that's toxic and that's, that's this and that's that. And then they Mm want to be like, well, I know it is because I had a friend, like what makes you think because you went through something you're perceiving as the same when you know nothing about the entire situation or the relationship that you are now an expert on someone's relationship. You don't even know. It's just gross. Like I can't tell you how many times Selena has said she just wants kindness. And if you're a fan of hers, you will be kind. Mm -hmm. So if you're a fan of her, then they'll, you're not doing what she wants by being ugly on the internet and talking shit about her best friend. And she also is a grown woman. Yes. Capable of making her own decisions exactly. and defending herself. You really think that if Selena had a friend that she didn't like or wasn't really... Didn't trust. Th- th- didn't trust and didn't treat her right that she would still be friends with them? Exactly. Like, you think no. she's not capable of handling her own battles? Like she thinks... You think that she needs you, a random stranger, to come and defend her? Yeah, like that's like, y'all... Calm down. Take it down a notch. Yeah, like y'all need to be humble. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the uh which I mean that kind of leads into something else. I wrote a couple notes down when mm-hmm. I was like watching the documentary. And one thing I, I I wrote down was that it you see a couple of times where like she gets to meet her fans, a couple mm-hmm. of her fans that 
in person and how much it means to them to be able to meet her to the point where they're just overcome with emotion. They're like shaking, crying, Mm -hmm. like so happy, so overwhelmed. Right. And so it, it strikes me as interesting when, when I see people have that reaction to a celebrity, cause a a, a little part of you is kind of like, get a hold of yourself, bruh. Like, (laughs) can you like kind of deep breaths and kind of like bring it down, Mm -hmm. calm down because you're getting so worked up and like, it's not, that's not a normal reaction to have to somebody. But I mean, I, this also isn't like a normal says the people that when we saw Taylor Swift in the nosebleed sections, we couldn't look at her (laughs) or we'd cry. (laughs) Exactly. So like when we went to go see Taylor Swift, we're in like, literally, like you said, the nosebleeds and both of us had the reaction of she literally on the stage was the size of an ant. She was so small. You could barely figure out which one was her when you're looking directly at the stage. But for both of us to look at her on stage, we couldn't even do it because it was too much. It was like, we were both going to cry. So we literally had to look at the screens that were all at the like top of the stadium and stuff and Mm -hmm. just watch her through the screen because that's where I'm comfortable looking at her. Exactly. I'm used to her being through a screen. Yeah. But she's in the So and again, I think it was the chair. I don't know if it came up on, um, it probably what didn't even pick up. Maybe not. Um, but I mean, it, it's like, so again, a part of you is kind of like looking at these people, like get a grip, like calm down. It's, it, it's okay. Like mm-hmm. deep breath. But then the other part of you is kind of relates to that. Cause it's like, you know, that you have that one, you know, that celebrity that if, or whoever that you, if you met them in person, you would probably have that uncontrollable. Like you can't control your emotions at that point. No. You're just so excited and happy and like just overjoyed like it's too much to contain so it's like it's so interesting that to me that these relationships with celebrities these friendships that they're one so one-sided between the fans and the celebrity the celebrity is never going to get to know all their fans that way right but then they reveal so much of themselves through their art through their music through the movies they make or whatever it is even through you know just bits and pieces on social media of their real life that Mm -hmm you feel like you're their friend. You get to know mm-hmm. them. You see, see them, you know, week in and week out and you feel like this intimate connection with somebody that's completely one-sided. So yeah. they don't, they don't know you. They're not connected to you in that way, but you feel like some sort of like soul, deep, emotional, like attachment to this person because you see some part of yourself reflected in them mm-hmm. or what they're putting out. And so that's just a very, it's not normal. It's definitely. It's not like a, well, I guess it is normal in the sense that it's pretty pervasive, you know, in Mm -hmm. society that it it just exists for Mm -hmm. a lot of people, but it's not like a healthy sort of, I guess, relationship, if you want to call it that. I don't know. It's yeah because when you think of like a healthy relationship or friendship, it's it's two ways, you know, you give and receive. Mm -hmm. So mm. it's, yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely like crazy. And those types of relationships have, I mean, really existed forever. Cause if it wasn't a celebrity, you might have like, Oh, there's the King or, Oh, there's this person, you know, these public figures that, or even like God, God, I mean, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's just all these like relationships that you have that can feel, or they pretty much just are completely one-sided, but it's also, I don't know interesting to me with the this i'm like i guess this is kind of segueing because it's not really make it's not building upon what you had brought up but one thing that i had noticed with her is i mean she looks very sad throughout most of the documentary but the parts to me that she does come to life is her one-on-one interactions with people Mm -hmm. like when she goes to texas and she's revisiting where she grew up or when she's in Kenya or when she is at, it's the afterwards of that um, mental health like talk where the, the gala or like mm-hmm. the when she's talking dinner. to some of the there's some girls that were in the audience yeah. that had struggled with mental health and um, they, they went up and talked to her one on one and it's like I believe her and like mm-hmm. that one girl's telling her how like she had attempted X amount of years ago and like Selena's so in tune with it feels like the human experience that she hugs her and even though you're like, oh, well, duh, but you'd be surprised how many people don't, they're scared of that mm-hmm. human connection. They don't know how to handle it or how to navigate it. And I'm like, she comes across, I always believe she was genuine because mm-hmm. I mean, I've always just, I'm very biased when it comes to her, but it was interesting to be like, 
she really does just seem like so genuine and so real. And she comes across too like someone who should have never been famous. Mm -hmm. Like not because she's not talented, but because she's stayed so grounded, it seems emotionally with the human connection where it's like those meet and greets and her having these conversations with people, that's what means the most to her. Mm -hmm. Like they even say at one point, they're talking about her going on tour and they're saying, you know, we want to, um, we have about for the meet and greets. They're like, do you want to, you have a lot of them scheduled. Do you want to keep basically do that many? We can scale them back. You can do more. And they're like, you know, we have an hour and a half budgeted for all those, but I mean, most of them probably won't take that long. And she even says, no, I milk it. Yeah, basically keep it at an hour and a half. I milk those interactions. And then they cut to and show some of her talking. They were, and they were it. so cute. I mean, yeah. she's so, I mean, it's just. she, And you can tell that she, it's not she's not milking it for them she's doing it for her like she wants to talk to them she mm -hmm. wants to feel close to them because i also think that reminds her of why she's doing it and realizing too like okay i am helping people or at least i'm giving them something to enjoy and you know mm -hmm. people do care and i think that you know it's just interesting because that's really when she came to life and what's so funny is it's sort of, it's not that she can't put the act on. Cause I mean, I, I think she clearly can if she has to, but there's sometimes the, like you can see celebrities, they have to just turn it on and they're like, mm -hmm. oh, you be. And it's like with her, that turn on happens more. It's not even like a turn on. It's so genuine when she's like that one on one interaction with people. She lights like, up. The, yeah, 100%. There's like, a like she's brought back to life, yeah. it feels like. There's a difference, I think. It's the difference between turning it on, turning on that charisma, mm -hmm. that warmth, that personality. Yeah. And there's a difference between turning it on and being, and, and lighting up, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, hundred percent. She's like, it's not an act. Like she's mm -hmm. literally so excited and happy. Yeah. And like, she asks people questions. Like she's so interested mm -hmm. and it's just like, yeah. And I'm, that even goes into like what they talk about a little bit toward the end of the documentary. She's doing a, it was when she did a zoom interview or like a FaceTime interview or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, with, there was a, the, I think it was like the surgeon general or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically she's talking to this, this person and they're talking about loneliness and mm -hmm. this is, you know, the midst of COVID-19 and the pandemic and everything. And, you know, he basically says that the key, there seem even before COVID-19, there was a surge in loneliness and loneliness isn't being alone necessarily. You can be surrounded by, you know, a crowd of people and feel lonely. Um, lonely is more of a state of a state of mind and a state yep. of emotional state, a state of being right. And so he said, and so they're trying to get to the bottom of like, how do we fix this problem? Because mm -hmm. feeling lonely leads to so many other things, you know, mm -hmm. it leads to it's anxiety, it's depression, it's, you know, uh, attempts at taking your life it's you know all these other things right and it, it's a real it's a real issue and so they say um she asks him like kind of what's how do we fix this what's the cure to loneliness and the guy says uh well the cure to loneliness we can see in studies that we've done is quality connection mm -hmm. it's not quantity of connection it's having quality human interactions yep um it like brings you back to yourself it, mm -hmm. it like centers you it makes you just feel like a person again mm -hmm. so and it's i mean you know you can to survive you meet you know there's physical needs you have to meet right you have to have food you have to have water you have to have shelter mm -hmm. but you also to survive and to thrive you need to satisfy like your emotional spiritual yeah intellectual like uh self as well mm -hmm. and so part of that is human connection that's what helps develop emotional intelligence. You yep. know, when you know people who, you know, have experienced things differently than you have, and mm -hmm. when you care about those people, yeah. you develop empathy for other people. Yep. It's the same thing as like, um, <gasps> the same sentiment behind like, how do you combat, um, you know, like anti-Semitism or um, what's the, when people are racist against um, Islamophobia or mm -hmm. xenophobia, you know, people that are other. How do you combat that? Well, I mean, if you have a neighbor or a friend or a classmate or, you know, your teller at the bank, if they are somebody who is different from you, 
but you are able to ev- develop that human connection to them and you know them and you know their family or you know the names of their kids or their dog or you know that they'd like to knit. Mm-hmm. You develop that human connection, you're less likely to be intolerant. Yep. So it goes back to, I think, that developing quality human connection helps you feel less alone because again, you develop emotional intelligence, you develop empathy, yeah. which I think is so lacking hundred percent in our world because so, especially as we become more and more antisocial, more, you know, it's, it's more and more of like not, social media is my social life. And like, it's not, it's no, not real. It, let me tell you, there's no replacement for meeting people in person, no. getting to hang out with your friends one-on-one, Yep. You know, there's even just sitting in the same room as somebody. You can both be sitting in the same room together on social media, scrolling and stuff, but it's different. It is. When you're, when you're there together. Yeah. You know? And, um, so the, the, I, I don't want to call him a doctor, but the, the guy she was talking to, mm-hmm. I, I think he was the surgeon general. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so she, he goes on to say that it's the quality human connection that helps to cure is the cure for loneliness. And then he says that service to others Mm -hmm. fosters that connection. It makes you feel like you have some sort of worth, some sort of value, something to offer the world. Yeah. And that's could be community service. It could be, um, philanthropy, like with what Selena's, you know, doing with, um, with the school in Kenya where she helped raise funds to help send girls to school, Mm -hmm. um, and provide scholarships for them. I mean, it could be physical service going to a soup kitchen, you know, like that. But he said, service doesn't necessarily have to be like charity work Mm -hmm. service to others could be literally just being a friend to someone it's being a listening ear a shoulder to cry on it's you know just being physically there for somebody that's providing some sort of value and some use to people yeah you know it's that's why um i mean you get so many people you know even i would say like mothers maybe who are going through depression or something sometimes what take carries them through is their children yeah because they are like some, I am of service to somebody. They depend upon me. Exactly. And if I'm not here, who's going to take care of them, you know? Yeah, so exactly. that's one small example. Yeah. Um, but I thought that that was really powerful and mm-hmm. really, um, I mean, the fact that it was, I mean, obviously they included in the documentary was there, but I felt like they could have been explored even more, you know? Yeah. I mean, I will say I'd be interested to know because there was 10 hours of footage and the original cut was either two or two and a half hours long. It, the documentary is an hour and a half long once it was released. So I am curious to know what was cut and if we'll ever see more from it. And I would I would really hope that we do because I felt like there was a lot that they may have explored that we didn't see. And I think that, you know, even though it was a hard watch, and I mean, I was like on the verge of tears almost the whole time because I, I just- cried. Yeah, I'm just like, there's this time- That's that why I'm upset you made me watch it. I was like but, all depressed and stuff this morning. It was a real bummer. <laughs> the documentary, it's really good. Yeah, I It's would, worth the watch. Yeah. But it's a, you be prepared. I mean, I hope that like, if anything, at least if you watch that, you can walk away with empathy. And I mean, there's a whole other thing to be said with the like celebrity experience that you could really even understand. Like, wow, like she was dealing with this and then here's what the outside sees. But so, yeah, I would hundred percent recommend to watch it. I think that it's a good watch. And I mean, I want to say she even shared at some point where you could get Apple TV free for a month. I think that was on her story. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that if you have access to somehow get it or get it free just to watch that documentary, I would. I think it's a great watch and I think you'll walk away with something, but just don't be petty. Just don't be petty like some people are being with this. Like, st- like Just be a more interesting human and open yourself up to what can I learn from this, not what can I criticize from this. If you've bought anything from Best Buy within the past like year or so, um, you and it was Apple, an mm-hmm. Apple product of any kind, whether it's a charger yeah. or an adapter or anything, you probably have, uh, like it was included with it was That's probably right. a three month subscription mm-hmm. to Amazon or to Amazon blah, to Apple TV for free yeah. for three months. Cause that's what mine was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got it from, I, th- I had several of them, uh, <laughs> but I recently just bought an adapter for my laptop and mm-hmm. it came with a three month yeah. subscription. So check your, uh, Check yeah. your Best Buy emails. Yeah. <laughs> you bought anything for Best Buy? Yeah. I'm sure if you buy straight from Apple or other places. Yeah, I think you get too. a lot of those too. I think even yeah. um, on Amazon, if you bought anything Apple, it did that. But well, guys, I think that about wraps it up. So, you know, this was fun. It was a slow start, but I feel better about it. Yeah, we got there in the yeah. end. I it wasn't was... feeling it at first. And then I was like, okay, we're good. Yeah, we're good. That was mostly my, my bad. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. I'm I, you put... <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. You put. I'm telling you, you depressed me with that movie this morning, that documentary. It put me in a bummer mood. I know. I was feeling weird the whole morning. You were like, now I'm just like, what do I do with my life? Mm. But okay, well, that is episode five. Hey, hey woohoo! So, um, I can never remember how to close it. What is it? I'm Anna. No, that's not the closing. <laughs> we never introduce ourselves. Oh, it's too late. I'm Jessica, but um, hit that subscribe button. Click the notification bell. Talk to them. Are you talking to your camera? I don't know. Talk, or talk to the... Should we... I feel like we don't use the wide shot enough. Should we talk to the main camera when we say our goodbyes? Probably. Okay, guys. So that being said, click the subscribe button. Click that notification bell so you can see whenever we do update our schedule is the video goes up on Tuesday. The audio goes up on Monday. So yeah. And you can listen wherever you listen to your podcasts or yeah. everywhere. And and follow us at Waypod. Yeah. W-A-Y-Y P-O-D. I was waiting for you to say and follow us on all the things. No, because I'm a hypocrite. Because I said I hate when people say the thing. Oh. I did the thing. And then I'm like, follow us on all the things. I'm I'm aware that I'm a hypocrite. Okay. Yeah. Really, the way, reason I hate it is because I see it. So, I oh, hate that it, part of myself. Self-projection. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Okay. We will t- see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.